When the Moulin Rouge opened, this was a cabaret in Paris. Um, so Henri Toulouse Lautrec was commissioned to do a series of posters. Uh, so this poster, we're starting to see the sexuality more that was present in the nightlife there. Uh, you can see that the dancer is doing the can-can, which was a popular style of dance at the time, where women would kick up their legs to expose their undergarments. This is the dancer Louise Weber, who was known as La Goulou, which means translates to the glutton, and that referred to her tendency towards drinking. And although Henry was a member of the French aristocrats, he wound up spending a lot of his time at these nightclubs. So because he was almost rejected from the aristocratic society because of an injury to his legs, he would spend a lot of his time hanging out at these uh, nightclubs, these cabarets, drinking absinthe and socializing and watching the mistresses and the dancers and the prostitutes, and he was part of this lifestyle. So this image has a lot of uh, free-flowing lines, a lot of sketched and painterly qualities to it. You can almost see the skeleton of it and imagine how he was um, drawing it from the ground up. The style is very expressive, very colorful, and a lot of loose flowing lines that created the image. This is an image of uh, one of his posters for the Montmartre Café concert. It was called Divan Japonais. And this image as well was created in the Japanese style. You can see more of a simplification, lots of geometric blocks of colors. Um, this is much more simplified, two-dimensional, and very minimalistic, modern. You can see in her dress these solid planes of flat color. No shading was used here. There are lots of curvilinear details, and this image was going to be displayed in a place that held a similar aesthetic to what you see in the poster. It was going to go very well on the walls that featured different Asian motifs and decorations. This image is of Jane Avril and the art critic Edward Dujardin, and she is another can can dancer. And so what's interesting is that even though you see them next to each other, they're not interacting with one another. There's almost a distant quality to it as you notice that the subjects of the poster are not looking directly at the viewer, they're staring off into the distance, there's a sense of detachment here, um, and you get the sense that this is sort of a spectator view, and perhaps this mimicked the artist's own sense of detachment from his daily life. So what was cool about these posters is that and they helped to have an effect on graphic design in that they were starting to represent the poster as a legitimate art form. Um, so this was just proof that there is artistic validity in creating po posters such as these. And as fate would have it, he eventually passed away from his own indulgences in 1901. This image for the publication Harper's magazine um, was actually, you know, even another example of the Japanese aesthetic. You can see this asymmetrical image. You can see that the, kind of the center point is right over here in that in another um, example where the artist uh, has depicted the people not looking directly at the viewer in the poster. So that's interesting. Uh, you're seeing again much of the planes of color, the flatness, you know, you get just these sections that are just colored in, these shapes of, of vibrant, pure color. Even in the background, there's very little shading going on. You've got just the, the ceiling and the walls, they're just covered in, you know, another color that is also present in the image. So you're starting to see that these images are looking very cohesive because the colors are present in multiple different parts of the image. These are done by the American artist Edward Penfield, uh, born in 1866. So he went to Paris to study art, and he was appointed to be the art editor at Hartburn Brothers in 1891. Um, what I noticed about this image is that it's metaphysical in the sense that they are the passengers who are very well dressed and riding this inner city bus are actually reading copies of the very magazine that this image uh, took the cover of. 
So they're reading Harper's Magazine, sort of suggesting to the viewer that when they see this cover, that these very well-dressed, aristocratic people are reading that same magazine. So you could argue that it's a subliminal message, but you know they're not really trying to hide anything. So you can essentially see that the Japanese style made its way into all sorts of Art Nouveau images at the time whether it was by an American artist or a European artist. And the Japanese style meshed very well with American art because Americans prided themselves on having very realistic realism images. And the Japanese art style was straightforward, to the point, unembellished, simplified, and that really spoke to the American artists of the time. So it's easy to understand why they employed this style throughout their posters. It's very iconic because of the very stark use of color, very separated lines. This is an image that would be able to be noticed from farther distances away because you don't have as much detail going on. You don't have as many motifs and dec decorations within the image. So now we're going to start to talk about the differences between how women were portrayed in Europe versus how they were portrayed in the advertisements in America. So in this image you see a very sexualized woman. You can see that she's barely kept inside the dress that she's wearing, that the straps are flowing and falling all around her, reflecting the uh, the swirling lines in her hair. So you can see this repetition in this style of art that Everything swirls together. The hair is definitely iconic within all these Art Nouveau images. And these swirling lines kind of lend themselves to that sort of energy carried throughout the image. So the idea here with the Waverly Cycles poster is to create the sense that this was riding this uh, bicycle was a very leisurely activity that beautiful women were taking part in. They really glamorized the appearance of having the time to go to the park and, and dress nicely and ride these cycles. This poster was actually commissioned by a British company who, of course, hired Muka, as you cannot mistake his style. This image almost lends itself to a dreaminess. The woman is kind of staring not straight ahead as if she's actually cycling, but kind of lost in, a, in her own daydream, if you will. And the way that they were able to get away with featuring such nudity and such provocativeness in an image like this was that they were showing, uh, they're portraying this woman almost like a goddess, almost like a piece of artwork. So that's how they were able to get away with employing this style. And that image can be contrasted by this piece by Edward Dent Penfield. And you can see that this is a much more realistic version of a woman riding a bicycle. She's actually staring straight ahead, and she's in a position where it is practical to actually be riding her cycle. And this is much more utilitarian, much more practical, much more cut and dry, much more typical of American art at the time. So this is happening a little bit after the Industrial Revolution where women are afforded more freedom and more having more ways to take charge of their own life. They're having the, the freedom to have leisure time and to be riding these bicycles. And they could take these on the streets and just follow the, the rules. And this was also uh, advertising an invention called the safety bike. So being out there being able to ride a bike, this offered women a lot more freedom. This image is by Will H. Bradley, and this is yet um, another exemplary piece of Art Nouveau artwork. You see that the text is clearly matching perfectly with the illustration and when it comes to the colors or the curvilinear lines. You definitely see how these have a huge interplay, and it's almost like the font was designed specifically for this image here. 
Um, another stylistic preference of the Art Nouveau is these interlocking O's, almost looks like a Celtic knot, or one of those motifs that you're seeing in Mucha's artworks. Uh, so you see that the red and black in the text in the subheading is present in these long flowing robes that the women are wearing. Again, you're seeing an unmistakable Japanese influence here. So in England, this is when there was starting to become an intersection between fine art and advertising. So we're seeing these iconic images, these pieces of fine artwork, and these were done, a lot of them by Sir John Everett Millet. Um, and what he, they would do was take these images uh, that were bought and add in the text that's advertising the product, so the logo, and then also making sure that you see the presence of the transparent soap. So these were kind of added in almost um, like modern day Photoshop, if you will, to bring back the rele relevancy of the advertisement while still being able to use a piece of fun artwork that was a little bit too nice to be created simply for the sole purpose of just having the advertisement. So it's a piece of artwork in its own right, but recycled into an ad once it is once we have the addition of the text as well as the product. This work of art is done by Aubrey Beardsley, and he was a young artist who was sought after. Um, for working with an art journal called The Studio. And he himself, uh, Beardsley, embraced the French symbolist principles. Um, and this is part of a parallel movement called the Aesthetic Movement. So this was centered among a very decadent art style. Um, they were more interested in enjoying the visual appeal of art rather than its historical origin, more of an art for art's sake. They also had a fascination for very provocative, sexualized images, and also a tendency towards the supernatural and mythological. So this image is called I Kissed Your Mouth, and what is nice about this is that it's black and white. So these were able to be reproduced with very inexpensive methods. It didn't take a lot to create these images, and as a result, they were able to be widely circulated. You can see a lot of very thin lines mixed with lines that get increasingly um, enlarged, but also tapering to kind of create the depth and illusion here. And this is depicting an image from one of Wilde's um, performances, the play Salome. This was published in French in 1893, and it's a reinvention of John the Baptist's execution. And it's done a little bit differently. Um, there's lots of sexuality and macabre imagery in it, and so even though this image doesn't directly correlate to the play, it is kind of suggestive of the content of it. So again, these images can be created by the line blocks because of their simplicity and their able, ability to be reproduced. And this is an, another example of one of his works. You see an elongation of the figures, an almost unnatural ideal form of the body, and a lot of decorativeness, and a lot of, you know, different playing around with different lengths of the line, so when you have thicker widths versus the thinner widths, it kind of creates balance in the image and idealism. This is another one you're seeing the motif and the swirling lines on the side that kind of mimic the swirls in the hair. And finally, we have some images of the rare um, commercial work that he did for the Avenue Theater, and you can see here that the text is meant to look like the Asian style calligraphy and that's one of the first times that we're seeing that. So though Beardsley was in prison shortly thereafter, you can see the enormous impact that he had on creating this new aesthetic style.